Hello? Test? Let me get my volume so I don't clip. I think I'm close to clipping. Let me uh, turn that down a bit. Do, 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 do. How's everyone doing today? We will uh, get this going in just a few seconds here. Input microphone. Oh boy. And there we go. That should be a little better. Now we shouldn't clip. It might be a little quiet, but I'd rather be quiet and then be able to scream. <clears throat> oh no, baby, what's, what's you doing? What's you doing, Doug? What we got? Boop. There we go. We have, uh, we did the thing. Let's delete this text, because that's annoying. Remove. Yes. All right. So here we go. We're going to start a uh, pretty high level. So this video is, since it's always archived, we're just going to start pretty high level. This is like the intro to this project. So we're going to kind of talk about what this project is, what the goals of it are, and when you get to use it. Uh, and the answer to the last one is, is basically never. So this project uh, I consider to be a research project. And a research project, to me, my interpretation of a research project is we're going to try to do something with no idea of whether it's possible. We're not doing something better or faster or in a different way of like an already solved problem. We're trying to approach a problem that potentially cannot be done. In this case, we're looking at writing a deterministic hypervisor and we'll talk a little bit more into what that means. Um, but the outcome of this project could be a complete failure and it's just like we couldn't get it to work we couldn't find a way to make it work fast enough we couldn't get the right hooks to make it deterministic there are many ways that this project could fail <clears throat> however there's a lot of things we can learn from it if we make mistakes along the way so what we can do is we can try to just get people learning how i write kernels and just learning random little things along the way so we're going to start out this stream in a kind of an interesting way um I'm going to kind of do like Q&A where I'm going to talk about this project and I'm going to answer any questions, but I'm going to go through setting up my OS development environment in the first place. This machine I just reinstalled. It's like my gaming machine that I don't do dev on. I just reinstalled Windows a couple days ago. I have nothing here set up for a development environment. So we'll go from a computer that was just installed to a full development environment and why I use the tools I do to write kernels. And that might sound really boring and really stupid, but I think the biggest investment I see people doing in OS development is how do you start? How do you build a kernel? How do you, do you build a PE and write a PE loader? How do you get all these things to work? So we're going to hopefully tackle all those today. And at the end of the day, hopefully we have a kernel that can print hello world to the screen. Um, that has a nice bootloader and we're running a 64-bit kernel. That is kind of the goal for today is to go from nothing at all to a bootloader to a bootloader that's booting a kernel that's relocated and it's a 64-bit kernel. So that is the goal. <clears throat> we might fail and that's fine. We'll learn things along the way. So we're going to start off. The first thing, this project is going to be written in Rust. And for Rust, we're going to go to, uh, let me get a window here. And I'm going to try and use this incognito window, and we're going to try and use all uh, free and open source tools to do this. So um, for Rust, uh, we want to go to RustUp, which is rustup.rs. Um, we can get this, which will allow us to install Rust. And we'll talk about that. We also need, uh, I don't think I have Visual Studio, so we'll get uh, Visual Studio Community. And the dev process I'm gonna be showing you today should be platform agnostic. We're doing Windows specific things because we're developing, on a, developing it on Windows, but it should be able to build and work on Linux. Um, so I'm gonna grab VS Community because it's completely free and everyone else can do this. And uh, while these things download and install, we'll be able to kind of talk about this project and what the goals are. So we'll just queue up kind of these big installs right away. And once these are going, then we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be happy, so. Okay, so this project is going to live on GitHub um, with the exception of maybe experimental things I try that I don't publish, but most of the things will end up on GitHub. Um, 
You'll notice this is a gaming computer and all of my links are to World of Warcraft, which I've been playing a lot in the past couple days. Uh, so this is called Orange Slice. And uh, let me select this. So uh, for Visual Studio, basically I only ever install the um, desktop C++ environment. That's really all I need. So I'm just gonna install that. <clears throat> Anyways, so the name of the project is Orange Slice. There's really no specific reason for the name of this project. I like to name my project at projects after food. And in this case, I have a mascot, which is this squishable. So for a lot of my large projects, I get like some physical object to remind me or like set in stone a project or a bug or an exploit or something that I did. In this case, I usually just go to Squishable, I like look for things, and then I pick the one that I think looks coolest, and in this case it was Orange Slice, so then I named the project Orange Slice. So uh, really nothing special there about the name. <clears throat> but, so the goal of this project is to write a hypervisor that runs on x86 and is capable of running guests in a deterministic way. And the reason that is different from all these other uh, hypervisors out there like Zen, KVM, Hyper-V, VMware, VirtualBox, like all these things, those strive to just run OSs but don't promise determinism. And it wouldn't be sane for any commercial project to try to ensure determinism because it's not something guaranteed to you by Intel or AMD. So in our case, we're going to try to find weird behaviors of the processor that kind of allow us to get determin determinism in an environment that it wasn't intended. So we're definitely writing a hypervisor that is not intended to work in this way. We're going to kind of read between the lines and exploit undefined behavior by measuring that undefined behavior and see if we can make that predictable such that we can make this deterministic. And that's why this whole project is very unique compared to most other hypervisors. Um, and also why this could completely fail. So I'm working on a new project at Microsoft with the team. Uh, I've got a great team of people that I'm working with now. Um, and we're doing everything built on Box and Box is very slow. So the goal of this is to bring the determinism of Box of a full system emulator to a hypervisor such that we get a speed up. In the case of Box, it's about 50 to 100 times slower than native execution. So booting Windows doesn't take a minute, it takes an hour. And because of that, that hurts fuzzer performance, that hurts usability, it's not as convenient to use, and all of these things add up. And so the goal of this project is to prove that this is possible, and if it is possible, then we'll hopefully roll this up into the project I'm working on at Microsoft, which is gonna be open source, so it's not like I'm doing this and then I'm gonna take it away from you guys. We're gonna take it away and polish it up and release it as a, as a serious tool if it succeeds. I would say there's like a 10% chance that we can accomplish this. We're gonna write a whole kernel to try something and then we'll probably fail. <laughs> so, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with failing. So we're gonna bring up uh, just kind of my standard customization of Visual Studio. We're not actually gonna dev in Visual Studio. I'm just getting this installed because it popped up. So at this point, we should have Visual Studio. We should have a 64-bit compiling environment, which is basically all we need. Um, and then we're just gonna grab Rust, which we grab the Rust init. Um, so one important thing about Rust when doing OS dev is we're pretty much always on nightly. So we can't use the defaults. We have to change this default toolchain to be nightly. And the reason for that is there are certain things in Rust that are gated by features that you can opt into. One of them is inline assembly and naked functions. And those are things that we use a lot in a kernel. So we kind of have to opt in manually to this nightly um, potentially changing version of Rust where yeah, every month we might have to change something to make it work with modern Rust. So, so this is kind of my standard setup, x86-64, MSVC is important, uh, nightly, and then modify the path variable. You can do the same thing on Linux. So the kernel that we're gonna build is actually going to be built with this MSVC toolchain, which you can use on Linux, uh, which is really cool. So, Everything we're doing here is all default toolchains from Rust. We're not going to build a libc like most kernels do. Uh, I'm gonna show you kind of the way that I do kernels and the way that I can 
get by with using an existing kernel. Boy, I love this precision on these uh, this estimated time. <laughs> that that's overkill. So, but yeah, that's kind of a a very high level of the goal of this project. Um, it's just to write a hypervisor and write a kernel along the way. Um, I haven't written a new kernel from scratch in about a year and a half, so I'm just kind of excited to get back into OS Dev. I've been doing a decent amount of OS Dev. I just haven't started a new project so this will just be kind of fun so i'm going to ask you're employed at microsoft what team i am at microsoft i'm under uh we get reorged like every week um but i think it's currently called platform security and vulnerability research uh it is technically part of azure but we work on basically everything that is she's a lot of things in windows outside of Office is like the only thing we don't work on, but we work on Azure, we work on REP and SMB and internal like DHCP things, we work on Hyper-V, we work on Sandbox for browsers, um, and all of these are pretty technical, all bug finding roles. Um, so I just started a new team there called Software Metrology, uh, and the goal is basically to make tools to make people find bugs faster and when they find bugs, that they can triage them and minimize them and get them fixed. Because a bug that we know about but isn't fixed has zero value to a company. Uh, is that different than the security team that works on Defender? Yes. I think we are relatively close to them. If we like go up a couple bosses, the Defender team is like a couple bosses up. We're under the same branch. But our specific team... Uh, of like, I don't know, 40 people or so is just a couple, just like one or two branches up. We're not Defender and three branches up. I think we Defender is now under that umbrella. We are, I think, in the same building as people working on Defender. So there's a lot of communication there and they help us out and we help them out. So anyways, that I now should have an environment where I can build a Rust program. So we'll just go over to my... Uh, D drive here, uh, we're just going to make a hello, I'm just going to verify that uh, the Rust compiler is working, and it should be, yep, so we have a compiler working and, and everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go to my other computer, uh, which you guys won't be able to see, and I'm just going to grab the, um, uh, I might need to format this drive, one second. Um, I'm going to go over to my other computer and I'm going to grab my most recent Rust kernel and we're going to use that kind of as, as reference. Um, but first I'm just going to format this drive so I can copy the source over. Disk management. Got to make it fat. For some reason it's detecting the wrong size. What is this? Doop, doop, doop. That fat32. Okay. So, apart from determinism, are there other features that may be useful in the context of fuzzing uh, for the hypervisor? So, I've written a couple hypervisors for fuzzing before, and there are many things you can do from code coverage to single stepping to, like, just getting introspection about the guest pretty much always improves your fuzzer. Um... So kind of the goal with this is really only determinism. I have no plans on really making a usable fuzzing hypervisor out of this code base. Um, I'm pretty much, I don't know why I can't format this drive. Um, weird. Uh, let me DD it. So the goal is basically only determinism here. However, there are many uses for hypervisors for fuzzing. And if we prove determinism, then we'll probably um, end up moving things over uh, to turn this into a fuzzing hypervisor. But until we've proven that determinism is possible, we're just not going to bother because I have existing hypervisors that already can be used for fuzzing. So, uh, zero. And I recognize that you guys can't see anything. I'm just moving files around. And when I'm dealing with USB sticks that I don't know what is on them, I don't like having the screen up. So we're just going to see 
Come on. Um, so I'm just bringing over my old kernel, which we'll kind of look through and we'll probably reuse a lot of the code, but we'll kind of talk through what we're reusing and why. So, sorry, transferring via USB really sucks on Linux. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, cool, close this. So I'll be like a, a minute or two more here, sorry. Of course, I'm using my slow USB 2 stick. There we go. All right, and then now I should have this over here. Let me make sure I can extract it. And I just have to prune a couple things out of this tree before I can bring the screen up again. So one second. Okay, this, delete that. And... Uh, Okay, blaming Linux for 2.0. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm blaming Linux on mounting being slow because I have to type a command because I don't have a GUI. Um, uh, RG, uh, okay, okay, so we might have to go, yeah, okay, we could get rid of that. That one I think is fine, that one might be fine. Uh, that I think we have to delete. Uh, okay, and then this. Um, let's see. Okay. So I might have to go prune a couple more things in a second, but we will just pop this up and I will grab uh, I'm also going to get VS Code, which I'm going to use for development. I like using Vim and VS Code. I use them kind of for different things, but streaming, you just have kind of better fonts, and it looks better, and the navigation makes more sense on a stream. Um, so we'll install VS Code as well. And this is kind of the initial uh, development environment that I set up on all my computers. And... Once this is done, cool, you have VS Code. Awesome. Okay, so that's good, blah, blah, blah. And the last thing we need to get is we're gonna get LLVM uh, windows, wub, wub So we're gonna get LLVM, and the reason we use LLVM uh, builds. We use LLVM so we can use the LLVM linker, LLD, and by using the LLD linker to build our kernel, we make our stuff platform agnostic, because you can get LLVM on Linux as well. So by having, by using LLVM and Rust, we're now kind of no longer tied to Windows or MSVC at all, um, and we should be able to build the kernel both on Linux and Windows. So like the kernel that we're about to look at, Sushi Roll, um, builds on Linux and Windows the same. It's completely identical and there's no custom processes, um, except for probably some hard-coded paths in the build environment, but that's, that's just me being lazy. So we're gonna get this, we want this in the path. And I think I just need to make sure, um, we just need to make sure that we have LD link in our path and we do. And this is a OS agnostic tool, that linker. So that allows us to link PE files on Linux and Windows in the same way with the same environment. Um, for, so now I'm gonna quickly, actually I'm going to install RG. If you've never used RG before, it's rip grep. It's a fast like grep slash ag replacement. Um, cargo install rip grep. So this will have to build it because it, uh, when you cargo install it, like downloads the source and builds it, but this will put it in our path, which we uh, 
we're going to use this a lot when we're searching through code and kind of looking through what we've done before. So this will probably take like 50 seconds, but that's, I wouldn't say that's too bad. Okay. Do, do, do. But yeah, this is kind of the standard process, but I mean, if I can, if I can show you guys how to set up to build kernels in uh, 20 minutes from a clean install of Windows, I think that's a, uh, that's a success. <laughs> so once this pops up, almost done. And Wub dubs 10, Wub, Wub do's 10. Yeah, I very often get my hand off by like one key press and I'll like type out a whole sentence before I realize that I just typed complete garbage. I probably should look at what I'm typing but I'm always reading something else on a different screen. Okay, so now I have RG. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna disappear for a second. I'm just gonna do a couple quick passes of my kernel and make sure there's nothing in there that I should not be streaming. Um, to do, do this, um, uh, that, okay, like that file. Where is that? Source. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. Sorry, I know you can't see anything. Change that. <coughs> Sorry. Oof. All right. Okay. And Buzzers. We can delete those. And main.rs. I think we can get rid of a lot of stuff in here. Oh boy. Yep. Yep. Okay. There. I think we can just delete everything here. And I think we can get rid of those. And I think we can get rid of that. And do to do, do. Yep, got to get rid of all the FBI backdoors. No one can see that my custom kernel that only exists at my own house and all of those back doors I install. Just in case, just in case it takes off and people like this, I just need to make sure it's it's backdoored so the the lizard people I report to are are happy. Um okay, I think that looks solid. Okay. And that is probably fine. Let me just do another couple greps. Uh uh, case and sensitive. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay, we have build artifacts. Let's delete those. Delete those. Uh, those. And. Oh, we gotta check out another one. Come on. Do, 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 do. So I have this bad habit of fuzzing with my like code and just like writing in a fuzzer. So I kind of have to like run around and be careful here that I don't have like fuzz inputs or private symbols or something referenced in here, which is not a huge deal, but I would prefer for it to not happen. Um, okay, let's see if this looks good. That, I think that's fair. That one should be fine. Those look good. Those look fine. Uh, okay, that. Uh, what's this? Yup. What is this? What is this? Yup. Get rid of that. God damn it. Why do I make such a mess of my projects? 
Why do I do this to myself? This is why I never can release projects with git history, because I just have way too many things checked in that should not be checked in. Uh, okay, that, that looks a lot better. And, oh yeah, no Twitch emotes, which sucks. Finally, um... Okay, that reading. Okay, okay. I th I think we're good. I think we're good. I think we've sanitized it. <laughs> cool. Okay, so we have my old kernel called Sushi Roll, which we're just gonna take the bootloader from and this, and probably this, and maybe these, and maybe this, and uh, take that, and we might need this, and we might want this. Uh, we want basically everything but the kernel. <laughs> So we're gonna ship these guys over. So we're gonna make a new project, and this is, actually I should check it out from GitHub. This will be github.com, uh, orange slice. So git clone. Uh, oh, I don't have git. Whoops. So get through Windows. See, you get to see all all the things that I don't have. Get 64 bit Windows. Now you get to see how I configure my Git. Which is basically everything default, but none of that because I don't like it. And then that and then that and native and as is commit unix and minty uh we use this and i guess we can keep those and whatever okay cool is sushi roll my own homebrewed kernel yes sushi roll is uh an old kernel that i started about a year and a half ago uh sushi roll is kind of pretty exotic it's a message passing based kernel there's no mutable shared memory it's impossible to have two threads or processes um, or processors access the same memory mutably. Um, so everything was done through message passing, which was just kind of an interesting design. Uh, I just did it because it'd be kind of more fun. It's just a different type of, of design. I did it mainly for my Xeon Phi, which is a 256 thread machine. Um, and a lot of standard traditional programming, programming models start to fall apart with 256 threads. So it was just kind of an experiment of um, how I could get that to work. Okay, did I? I didn't get clone it, did I? Okay. GitHub.com, and this is orange slice. Cool, and hopefully it's still on my clipboard here. It is, okay. So we should be able to go into here and we're just gonna spend a little bit of time getting this old bootloader up and running. So I have, uh, okay. So I have to install this. Uh, the bootloader is written in 32-bit assembly and the kernel is 64-bit. And we're gonna talk about the architecture of this bootloader. Um, cargo, uh, rust up, target, add this. So I use Rust to build the kernel, and we can see why this is failing. Couldn't execute NASM. Oh, I use NASM for the stage zero as well. So we'll go to uh, nasm.us and download the latest, and we'll have to get this in our path. But I think this is the last tool before we can get that kernel to build. Uh, yeah, we'll run this as a priv user. Do, 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 anyone, this, copy that, Vern, set this up, edit the path, uh, 
Okay, and that won't take effect yet in this shell, so we'll just open a new one. And hopefully this builds. This is taken from Linux. Um, it looks like it... Uh, LLD link 7 not found. That makes sense. Uh, because it should just be LLD link. Um, you can open this up. VS Code. And... We'll delete this. And... Okay. So... Don't show the welcome page, and then this will probably have us install some Rust stuff. But I just need to change this config, and I probably have a hard-coded LD Link 7, which will just be LD Link. And I think everything else stays the same. And could not find, could not invoke flatten script, which means I don't have Python installed either. Okay, apparently I have Python as well. So we'll get this going too. Do do do. Uh, Python three seven three. Sixty four bit Windows. Uh, can you explain a bit how you would eventually fuzz Windows applications with a custom kernel? My understanding of the advantage here is reducing the process setup and teardown penalty in Windows. So everything that we do, it's actually. Um, my boss wants to do a talk on snapshot fuzzing. So basically all the fuzzing that I've done in the past six or seven years pretty much all relies on snapshot fuzzing. And snapshot fuzzing is basically when you're, like let's say you your user input, you're fuzzing an XML parser and your XML parser reads XML from a file and then hands that off to a parser which parses it. So what I would typically do, I would have a, um, fuzzer that, or I would have a kernel or emulator or hypervisor that would, I would put a breakpoint right after that file was read into memory, right before it's first used for parsing. I would put a breakpoint there and I would take a snapshot of the entire running system in all device states at that point. So from there, all you do is change the in memory contents of the file, resume execution, and then when you get a crash or when the parsing fails or something you can immediately reset in in the order of like hundreds of microseconds can reset the VM back to its original state and continue execution. Um, so you're able to very rapidly iterate fuzz cases through something that's very targeted. You're taking a whole snapshot of the whole operating system and you're restarting from the same location. So for example, when I first started fuzzing with my first hypervisor, Fulkervisor, I fuzzed Word and uh, Windows Defender. Word has a really long startup time. The splash screen, like when you click a file for the first time, it takes probably about five to 10 seconds for that file to load and it to get displayed in Word. But in the case of my snapshot fuzzer with the whole hypervisor, I was able to take a snapshot right before the first byte was used to influence control flow. So before, like, I went to the first access of the red bytes from the file. And that allowed me to immediately start fuzzing, and I skipped that initialization and startup process of Word itself, which led to, instead of running one fuzz case every 10 seconds, I was running about 5,000 fuzz cases per second on Word while gathering code coverage and feedback and basically doing AFL-style things, but I also got to see where it entered the kernel, and I got to do code coverage in all those... Um, aspects. It was just the whole system runs under the hypervisor and everything's getting code coverage and feedback. Um, so with snapshot fuzzing, you can just dramatically reduce the amount of code that runs during a fuzz case. Um, and also it helps with determinism because you're resetting to a previous known state. It doesn't guarantee determinism because times can still change and interrupts happen on different boundaries. But the ASLR states are the same, and those like system level determinism things are usually pretty concrete, and the allocator is pretty predictable, which is nice. So logically, the CPU is pretty deterministic. Uh, does that answer the question, or did I go on a tangent? Anyways, uh, we need to open up the prompt again, and so now. Couldn't see it during the kernel. Okay, so this is because my build script is designed to also build a kernel, which we don't have yet. 
Um, so this is kind of, uh, we can start going through how I architect the design of this bootloader and build process. So basically, I do all of my kernel development using um, Pixie because I have no reason to like run a floppy back and forth. I'd rather use Pixie Boot so I can have my machines automatically use the latest kernel when I reboot them. Um, so the old kernel was called Sushi Roll and that kind of the paths to the kernel. So this is the build script that I used. It's written in Rust, and that's just because I, uh, I think I have one thing that's still written in Python, but the goal is if I can get everything in Rust, I can reduce one more build dependency on Python, which just makes the build process a little cleaner. So this is just cleaning it up. Basically, if you're cleaning it, it goes into the bootloader, runs cargo clean, goes into the kernel, runs cargo clean, and then removes some, some bootloader like early stuff. Uh, this is for documenting both the kernel and the bootloader. And then for building stage one, we go into the bootloader, we build the uh, executable that is the bootloader. It's a 32-bit it's a PE file that's built by Rust. Once that is done, we then run it through a Python script, which I'll show you now. Um, actually, we have it open. So we have a Python script called flatten PE. And what this is going to do is it's going to basically take the PE format, which is somewhat complex. Like, PE is pretty simple, so are elves. Um, it's just going to parse the information that I care about from the PE and flatten it out into kind of an in-memory loaded image format. Not perfectly in that format, but close. Um, but kind of the goal of this is it, it just flattens it such that I can use a PE and I'm not writing a custom linker script. I would much rather just write a normal kernel and build it like I am doing in Rust rather than have to manually specify a linker script and make a custom version of glibc that I build that's only for my kernel and disable red zones. Um, so you might be wondering why do I target PEs and MSVC? And the reason for that is on... Uh, in ELVs, in the SysV ABI, they allow for red zones. And red zones is an amount of stack that a function is able to access that is above the current stack pointer. Um, so basically, you'll end up having, like, let's say this is address 0, and this is address FFF, and your stack pointer is currently here. So... Technically, everything in this area above the stack pointer in the stack, this is like initialized data, and, or not necessarily initialized, but this is like valid data that cannot be modified. And if, so when an interrupt comes through in kernel mode, the processor itself is going to push information onto the stack. So it's going to move, it's going to subtract from the stack pointer, push something, subtract from the stack pointer, push something, uh, and it's like five things it pushes onto the stack uh, for you. It's kind of like a, a call, roughly, where it's putting a return address of where to return back to after the interrupt is done. But in the SysV ABI, they added red zone supports, which allows this, like, I think it's 40 hex bytes above the stack pointer. So the stack pointer points to here, and everything below here is stack. But it allows functions to use memory above the stack pointer or a lower address than the stack pointer, which is technically unused, which means if you build a standard program for Linux uh, or you like make a kernel using standard libc toolchains, there will be functions that refer to this data and then an interrupt comes through and will push stuff onto the stack and overwrite that data and further, this might influence an interrupt. So... Um, I think this is a, was that a decent description? But basically, that's the SysV ABI, which a lot of people think of as like the Unix 64-bit, 32-bit ABI for x86. Um, but the MSVC ABI does not have a red zone, which means the MSVC ABI out of the box can be used to build kernels. What's really nice about that is since Rust supports the MSVC toolchain and uh, Rust on Linux, or FreeBSD or OSX or whatever you use can target those things. All you have to do is do rust up target add x86-64 PC Windows MSVC. You can add that on Linux. And we're able to build 
a PE on Linux using Rust and all the Rust toolchains, and then using LLVM for a cross-compatible PE linker. Um, and at the end of the day, we have a bootloader, which is uh, bup, 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 here. We have a bootloader, and we have an output for the bootloader, which is this stage1.exe. And it's a 20K, it's a tiny bootloader, because we have a 32K limitation. So we have to fit within 32K. And uh, I don't have Ida. I think I have Ghidra, though. I might not have the JDK that can get Ghidra to run. Let Yeah, I don't have the JDK. Let me, uh, I'll kind of do that in parallel. I'll get the JDK going. Um, do, do, do. Uh, was it JDK 11, I think is what it wants. Except Windows. We have to get Java in the path for Ghidra to work as well. Um, but yeah, so we're able to just build an actual executable directly here on both Windows and uh, on Linux, and then we run that through our Python script, which we converted into our nice bootloader format. So if we look at our bootloader, we have a stage zero dot ASM, and this contains the entry point of the bootloader or uh, yeah, of the bootloader and the whole OS chain. Basically, it has the first instruction that gets executed. So in this case, we have uh, stage zero dot ASM. Let's, uh, let's search for some syntax highlighting for this. This one is the good one. And did that already take effect? I don't need to restart, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so this is what the boot the initial stage zero this is like some of the only assembly code in this entire project is this uh i don't know 200 lines of code or so um so basically what i have is we this is the entry point it's at ox 7 coo this is in real mode 16-bit assembly so this is where the BIOS passes off execution to the bootloader of any kernel. So if this were Linux, this would probably be Grub or uh, I forget what the other, I think it starts with L, Lilo, Lilo, is Lilo old? Is that, is that dating, is that dating me? I don't know if people still use that. Um, but this is the entry point. So first thing we do is we clear interrupts. We then clear the direction flag. Um, I couldn't find a spec that like, told me that for sure BIOSes are required to clear these things, so I just do it as the first thing. I blindly set the A20 line. So in the processor for legacy support, when the processor boots up, all addresses are mod 20 bits. So if you try to access over one meg, it will actually loop around. So memory will, um, so like if you access address one megabyte plus one, this actually ends up reading the address at physical adder one. And that's a legacy thing from way back when that the processor still boots up. Um, so we blindly set the A20 line, which is a little bit risky, but any system that is that can run 64-bit, this will work on. Uh, technically, you could fingerprint this and be better. So we also don't know what the state of DS is. So we're gonna XOR AX and we're gonna populate DS with that. So we now have a segment descriptor that is a known state, which is zero. And we're gonna use that to load up the 32-bit protected mode GDT. And the GDT is basically what describes to the processor where the different segments line up. So when you see like in Winbag, you see CS is equal to 2B, that is referencing the offset into this table. So 2B is technically 28. There are some bottom bits that are some, um, that are just informational or like set some modes. But that would mean, so this would be, um, this would be segment zero, which is the null segment, the null descriptor. This would be segment eight, and this would be, or selector eight, and this would be selector OX10 hex. And we'll see those in a couple of seconds. So we load that GDT, which sets the processor up such that it can reference those things. And then we enable protected mode. So enabling protected mode puts the processor into 32-bit mode uh, once we complete the next long jump and select the segment. So this, in this table, these magic numbers, one of these bits specifies that this is a 32-bit code segment, which is used um, 
to determine which operating mode the processor is in. So after that, we do a long jump by specifying the specific selector we want to use to PM entry, which is the protected mode entry point. Um, and you can see we then set the assembler to be in 64-bit mode from this point on. And that's selecting the, the second entry in here, which is this. This is uh, CF9A, so this is the limit in here, this FFFF. The CF is also part of the, the limit. The base is in the zeros, because we're using a, a zero-based segmentation model. And then the 9A, uh, I forget which bit's in here, but 9A says it's a code segment, 32-bit code segment, and 9.2 says this is a 32-bit data segment. Um, I probably should break this down and make it more clear what these fields are, but I've gotten so used to typing this out that it's just like muscle memory now. So that launches us into protected mode, and now we're running 32-bit. Uh, another benefit here is we don't have paging on. So back in 16-bit mode, we can't access, um, we're unable to access uh, things over a meg of RAM unless we went into Unreal mode. So in 16-bit, in your pointers are 16 bits, but you also have a segment, which is also 16 bits. And the way it works is the effective address used is the segment shift four plus the um, address. So what this means is since this is a 16-bit offset and this is a 16-bit, uh, uh, I guess, segment, since it's shifted left by four, this means the effective space you can address is 20 bits. It's technically a bit over that because you can like rely on an overflow, but 20 bits is one megabyte. So in 16-bit assembly, you can only address one megabyte of RAM. And that is kind of an issue for us because we're going to be loading a kernel which could exceed one megabyte. And that's why we write our bootloader in 32-bit protected mode code, um, but we don't enable paging, which means at this point, we can now access uh, 32 bits of memory, which is four gigabytes, which is directly identity mapped. So we are unable to access memory greater than four gigs, but our bootloader doesn't need to touch things greater than four gigs, so we're fine. Um, we then set up the segment, the data segments for protected mode. So we set the code segment for protected mode by setting this to eight. Um, so here we're setting up all the other different segments. This is the uh, uh, this is used in this like string operations. The data segment is the one that's used generically everywhere. FS and GS people use all the time for pointing to like thread locals, um, and SS is used during stack operations like pushes and pops. Um, we then set up a stack. So our kernel or our bootloader, this stage zero, is loaded at address seven C zero zero. So we set our stack to 7C00, which points directly to the first part of our code. Where did I go? Um, so that the stack now points to this byte, this CLI instruction. But we know, based on uh, like this bio specifications and stuff from OS Dev, that the stuff before it, there's uh, some predefined amount of space that's available for use. So if we look at um, OS Dev memory map, um, and a lot of this bio stuff gets really flaky because people don't always do it right. So 7C00, this is your OS boot sector. It's valid for 512 bytes when you're loading from like a floppy or CD-ROM. But when loading from, um, when loading from Pixie over the network, it actually can be up to 32 kilobytes. And that's where I get that 32 kilobyte limitation for this Rust bootloader. So if I can fit everything in 32K, then I don't have to do another stage of my bootloader to prepare for the next stage. I can directly have the entire bootloader put in the correct spot by the BIOS for me via Pixie. Um, and then right before the bootloader sector is this memory, 30 kilobytes of completely guaranteed free-for-use memory um, right before. And that's what we're using for the stack temporarily as an early stack of this uh, bootloader. So we've now set up a stack, and then what I do is I zero out the entire range of the kernel. So we load the kernel at 10,000 hex, um, 
or I think this might not be the kernel, but this is probably where the the bootloader gets loaded. Um, I'm not 100% sure. So I zero that out, which means I no longer have to zero out sections that are larger than the size. So basically it's common that like a PE or an ELF, when you load them, you zero out any like remaining data that is not accounted for in raw file contents. And then I have a very simple parser. So my flat flatten PE, this Python script, converts a PE into this very simple to parse thing where I get the number of sections and I loop through all of the sections, getting the virtual address, a pointer to the data, and the size of the data. And then I copy that, rep move SB is very similar to like a mem copy. I copy that to the location that they should go in this kernel range. And then I keep in loop. And you might be thinking there are a lot of bugs here where there can be issues like if if I lie about the sections or the virtual address, I'm going to write to arbitrary memory. But this is a bootloader, and the uh, PE is embedded into the bootloader, so I just don't care about checking bounds of things because you're literally supplying the arbitrary code that's going to run as kernel mode anyways. So, so here, yep, I'm going through while I have an entry left. I go through, I copy that entry to the correct location, the correct section, and then I loop forever. Finally, when that's complete, I set up the uh, stack frame that the bootloader expects to have on invocation. I set a global in the bootloader to mark that we have now booted once. So this first boot is initially set to one, which allows me to tell the bootloader whether this is the first time this kernel has booted. And the importance of that will, and the soft reboot entry will come later, but basically I'm able to replace the kernel in memory while it's running, which allows me to quickly reboot and prototype kind of in this environment where the kernel just immediately gets replaced. Um, since I do a lot of development on servers, which have like two to three minute BIOS post times, this means I can do rapid development because it takes me 10 milliseconds to replace the kernel and reboot the kernel, do the soft reboot versus having to power down and restart the whole machine. And then finally, we just jump into the entry point that was told to us by the flat PE. And that's it. This is all the assembly. This is all I have to make sure that I get correct assembly-wise. Um, there's another basically copy of what we saw before. This is for AP. This is for the... So when you see BSP in this code base, BSP refers to the bootstrap processor, which is the first processor um, that gets execution. So on x86 one processor is handed off to you for execution, and then it's your job as a kernel or bootloader to then launch by sending an uh, events and interrupt to the APIC to launch up the other bootloaders or the other cores on the system. Um, when the other cores come up, they come up in this location. So we specifically pad out, uh, since this is loaded at OX7C00, and we uh, make sure that this pads out 400 hex bytes, this AP entry is at address OX8000. And this is important because we end up passing an 8 to tell uh, which page uh, to that the um, application processor entry point is. So here we do the same thing. We like set everything up. We set the protection bit. We jump to the AP PM entry. Um, oh, actually, yeah. Here we jump to AP PM entry, which is the same... Uh, where do I have this at? Uh, this is at the end here. We set up the data segments again. We set up a stack. Now we have multiple threads using the same stack, so it's important that only one core is booting at a time. So we basically make sure that a core has completed booting by the time we spin up another one because this temporary stack can only be used one at a time. Um, and then we jump into Rust here. And here's where we include the actual flattened Rust uh, binary that we built with flattened PE. Uh, finally, we have in here, we have the soft reboot entry, which we'll talk about more, but basically the kernel jumps here from 64-bit to this fixed location, which is passed as an argument, the, soft, the address of the soft reboot entry. So when the kernel wants to do a soft reboot, it just jumps into here, which will set up the stack, it will clear all the register state, it will load the 16-bit real mode, GDT, which will switch from 64-bit mode all the way back to 16-bit real mode assembly. Then we'll jump to re-entry uh, long jump. Um, 
a note here because AMD doesn't support 64-bit offsets. Uh, Re-entry long jump will jump us to ARM mode again. We'll disable paging, disable long mode, load up all the segments in a sane way, disable protected mode, zero out the GPRs, and then load all these and go back. And then we jump to the start. So basically, we kind of undo all of the things that we set up in the bootloader in these routines such that we can jump directly back to the start of the bootloader and it can restart uh, while it's running. So we just go right back to the entry point of the bootloader after we tear everything down. So that is kind of the stage zero, which is very simple. I tried to keep this as small as possible because this code is not in Rust, it's written all on assembly. The This is the highest chance for me to introduce pretty catastrophic issues into my OS and bootloader. So once that's done, that will then jump over to main in the bootloader. And this is the main entry point of the uh, bootloader itself. And we're gonna hop over into main. And you know what, let's... Uh, I'm gonna show you, before we hop into this, I'm gonna show you kind of, I'm gonna get this up and running. So I've got Hyper-V, which I installed. I haven't used it, so hopefully it's in a working state. We're gonna give this, we're gonna call this test VM. Um, we're gonna give it 256, ah, we'll give it 1024 megs of RAM. Doesn't need an, uh, it will need a network. And then we don't need a hard drive for it because none of, None of this kernel will have a hard drive. Everything we're gonna do is over the network, so we're never going to um, have a hard drive or IDE controller. So now what I'm gonna do is, I think this is good. I want to boot from legacy network adapter here. Uh, I need to remove this. So to boot in Hyper-V, to boot from Pixie, you need to use the legacy network adapter. So I'm switching over to legacy, and we're gonna set that as the number one boot priority. So we'll see that this will try to boot from Pixie, which is network remote-based booting, and it's gonna fail because it's never gonna get a DHCP lease. Uh, actually, my PFSense box might do that. So, um, okay, so we're gonna power that down. I'm gonna make a new switch, and we're gonna call, this is gonna be an internal switch, which is a switch between the host and the guest, but the guest doesn't get access to internet. This is gonna be uh, OS dev net. And we're just gonna make that new switch. And we're gonna, gonna configure this VM to use that switch rather than default switch, which is internet access. So there's no way for this to get a DHCP lease, which is great. So what I'm gonna grab is a tool called TFTPD, which is just a uh, TFTP server and TFTP is how the BIOS downloads the, uh, the kernel image. So TFTPD is just a, I think it's both Windows and Linux, um, but this is what I use on, on Windows. On Linux, there are plenty of TFTP servers. You could look for you know any like set up Pixie server Linux, and like all of these things will tell you how to do exactly what I'm doing right now, but on Linux. Uh, TFTP is a well-supported thing that that a lot of people um, a lot of people have used. So TFTP is 20 years old. So this this tool has been around a long time, and we're gonna use the um, we're gonna use the uh, standalone version TFTPD. We're gonna put this here, and I'm gonna move this to my D drive. And then another thing is we're going to we're just gonna run it. Um, actually, first, before I do that, I'm going to configure my network interface for the, um, oops. Uh, I'm going to configure and have a hard-coded IP for the OS DevNet. So for this, we're gonna set a static IP of uh, 10.11.1.1, 25.0, 0. We don't need a gateway because there's no internet. So since we're going to be running a DHCP server, we're going to want to have that uh, set up. So here we can select the NIC that we want to run this on. Um, in this case, I think everything just like works by default. We don't need a client. We don't need a syslog server. 
Um, cool, and then we'll just restart it. And this should hopefully be running a DHCP server that now this guest will hopefully be able to hit. Hopefully. Ah. Uh, come on. Hmm. Yeah, TFTPD has been along for around for 20 years. It's the, just this software. Yeah, this implementation. Um Cool. Uh, would you be able to explain the bootstrapping process of a Type 2 hypervisor on an already running OS? Um, I'm not like, I don't know. I haven't done many Type 2 hypervisors, so I know roughly how they work, but I just don't want to speak to them because I don't understand them nearly as well. So I just, I don't trust my knowledge on that as well. So I, I just don't want to speak to that. Sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So, question is, why is this not coming through? Um, TFTP, uh, DHCP, bind to this address. And, oh, uh, this might be trying. I might need to give it a pool here. Two size of pool. I, I don't know if this is the size of the subnet or not boot file this is going to be called um, orange slice dot boot uh, default router is 10.11.1.1 DNS servers and uh, and we'll restart it just in case hopefully this will get us going come on there we go Okay, got a lease, uh, TFTP error, uh, file not found. Uh, it looks like someone tried to access orange slice.boot, which doesn't exist, which is great. Okay, we are in business. So what I'm gonna do is where I go to flatten the PE, I think that's done here. Um, basically everywhere where we say sushi roll, we're gonna change this to the new kernel name, which is now orange slice. And then we're going to add a deployment path. This is basically like all of my different systems where I potentially store um, my TFTP server file. So I just add another path to there and that should get copied into here when I build it. Uh, kernel path, okay. So hopefully this will now have an orange slice dot boot here. And if we run this, um, this should now Theoretically boot, uh, there we go. So this is running the bootloader and it doesn't look like it because we now, uh, I do everything over serial. And the reason I do things over serial is because serial allows me to connect up a program which then can, um, which I can then copy and paste out of, right? I can't copy and paste out of the graphical buffer here. So I'd rather print to this. So I wrote this program, which is called uh, debug console. All it is, is a, this is designed for Hyper-V, and it's intended that you can attach this once. So every time you start and stop the VM and reset the VM, it kills the uh, COM port. So this is just a fallible thing where it can try to open the serial session in a loop, and it allows me to reboot the VM, and it automatically reconnects. So uh, it looks like I used pipe COM1, which is what I'll put here, and apply that. And now, hopefully, I haven't used this in a long time. Um, debug console, cargo run. Do to do. So now, this will hopefully give us kind of like a persistent uh, serial session that we'll be able to use. I like how this has a longer build time than my kernel. So now I should be able to launch this. And hopefully... We, okay, we got... Uh, read request for sushiroll.kernel. You know what? I might not be printing anything. My... So the bootloader has a strong requirement that it has to be under 32k. I do print something here... Hmm. 
the fact that it's trying to grab sushi roll dot turn means that I think it's working. So we're gonna say this is now uh, orange slice bootloader. I'm gonna search for sushi roll and uh, we'll change this to orange slice. And this is now orange slice. And I don't know. Hmm. I don't know why I'm not getting that print out. Com one, pipe com one. Um. Huh. So what's interesting is that it's like attaching to something. So let me just rename that. Maybe it's the name of it that's throwing it off. Because COM1 is kind of like a semi-reserved name. Um, not that anything for pipes should be reserving that, but let's just see. We'll go into uh, debug console. We'll change this to uh, uh, kern debug. And let's see what this says. New serial session. Uh, okay, we'll we'll see. That. Okay. I think I remember seeing issues with the serial ports in Hyper-V. I don't know if they're currently broken. Uh, that's really frustrating because it's clearly working. It's this, the debug console, um, I guess unless I'm not sending it to the serial port, but I, let me see how I do that. Let's quickly look at my serial driver. Serial, this is rotten and shared. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Yeah. Hmm. Let's. I'm gonna grab Putty quick and see if I can manually connect in. But I don't know why the. I think this is legitimately a bug in in Hyper-V. I I think they've been having issues with the serial port, which is really frustrating. But Putty allows me to have a serial session, and Putty usually seems to be the most reliable one. So we're going to go Putty and serial port. We'll do slash the thought slash pipe. Uh, kern debug, I think is what I called it. This and open. So that's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see unable to open, which is good types kern debug so hopefully we can start this vm and hopefully that will instantiate the serial port no ah. uh kern debug uh, one pack 200 okay unless it's raw is it raw here no, I don't think it's raw. Um, I'm pretty sure you can use name pipes and putty. I, I think I've done it before. So type pipe uh, kern debug. All pipe instances are busy. We could do this. Like what I'm used to is that you can't open this session until the VM is active. I. Ah. Hmm. Hmm. That's really frustrating. What am I going to do? Hmm. Like I, it's not. It's definitely not the serial driver. It's a. It's an issue with K, uh, with Hyper V. Ah, oh, that's super annoying. 
why is that not working? Like, I remember running this like a year ago and it didn't work. And I was like, how did that break? Oh, <sighs> that's so frustrating. Cause now I'm gonna have to debug something that shouldn't have to be debugged cause it's not my fault. But the fact, like, what is this possibly connecting to? Like, how is it able to get, it's able to open a file that doesn't exist. Uh, right, new serial session. And I can only get here if I've opened a file descriptor. And this will be, we'll print FD. Uh, FD, FD, not implemented for file, from raw file. So print opened handle x handle okay and then we'll just put that back uh, do, do, do. unless it's yeah generic read generic write open existing overlapped io lower hex not implemented for that uh, yeah it's a pointer What the, like, what is this opening a handle to? There's no name pipe on the system with that name. Like, if we do that, is it is it gonna open a handle to this non, yeah, exactly, okay. So the problem is like, for some reason, this is, I'm able to open a pipe that doesn't exist. So I guess instead of create file, I could use the, what is it? What is it like? Open open name pipe. Uh, disconnect name pi connect name pipe. But I think that's on a handle. Create name pipe. Unique pipe name. Blah blah blah. The open mode. Uh, inbound or duplex. So. I don't think this is actually a Hyper-V thing. I think this is a Windows thing. Named pipes you before could open with create file. And I've been using, I've been using this code for like three years, but something happened in the past year where you can no longer open named pipes. Like I'm saying open existing. And if we looked at open existing for create file, open existing, uh, let's see. Yeah, open existing is open a file or device only if it exists. And we can put in any string here. I definitely don't have a name pipe named this on my system. And for some reason, it gladly opens that as a handle. It's like, yep, I can I can get you a handle to that pipe instance. Uh, I, that's, I have no idea how name pipes are so broken. So that's really frustrating. So now we have to go and probably change up this code base that historically worked forever because something's broken in Windows. Oh, that's so annoying. So I guess we'll have to switch to probably create name pipe unless there's, is there like an open name pipe? Open, no, I don't think so. Yeah, name pipes are terrible. Unix, uh, Unix, sockets are so much better but for some reason well we just got unix sockets in windows okay so what we can do is i guess this is going to create name pipe create an instance of a name pipe and return it handle for subsequent operations can i do overlapped here can i do overlapped here because i need to be able to do overlapped uh non-blocking read and writes so we'll give it a shot. Uh, what are we using? We're using kernel 32. I think this is a deprecated trait. Um, okay, so we're gonna do pipe. Uh, connect name pipe, I think. Okay, that's where you can do overlapped, perfect. So we'll do create name pipe W. Oh, handle is equal to kernel 32. Create name pipe w self dot file name dot as pointer. Then 
the open mode, which is going to be pipe access duplex. I don't know where that is in the namespaces of things. We'll see if it's in here. Nope. Uh, to Rust. Uh, docs, 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 documentation. Okay. Are we using WinAPI? Yeah, we are. I think everything doesn't want to work for me today. Not not a good sign. So uh, hopefully Rust will just tell us where that is in the namespace. Um, then this is file flag overlapped. If it's enabled, they can. Okay, so we'll set set overlapped as well. Uh, and that will be this. So we'll do overlapped. So we have the file name, we have that it's overlapped, then we have the pipe mode, which is going to be pipe type byte, which we'll just say that. Then following modes, non-blocking mode is enabled. Uh, read file, write file, blah, blah, blocking mode, one is specified here, the operation is not completed until our data. Okay, I think we want to do pipe await. Then max instances, uh, we can do this, uh, out buffer size, in buffer size, so we can do like, I don't know, 64k, and default timeout, uh, a value of zero, we'll okay, we'll do zero. Then security attributes, which we can do null, which is this. And now we're going to have a bunch of build errors because this is not right. Panic. Uh, handle P. Handle. Okay, so expected eight parameters. We missed a parameter. Oh, did we do one more? Okay, so here we have, we can start grabbing some of these. Uh, unlimited pipe instances, win base, win base, win base for all those. Okay, and takes eight, but specified nine. We probably uh, doubled up on only so. Open mode, access duplex, and overlapped. Pipe mode, byte, type byte. And then pipe weight. Oh, that is part of the mode here. Okay. Handle negative one. Okay, that's good. Hopefully, if we launch this, maybe it will work. Hopefully, this will give a non negative. Nope, still negative one. So we have no idea what's going on. We'll be able to do this uh, kernel. 32, get last error. And we have an error 123. Windows error codes here, and we're searching for 123. Error invalid name. Okay. So, create name pipe. It should be in the following form. Slash, okay, so not two slashes? Is that the issue? It just wants that? Okay. Um, must have the following form. Slash, slash, dot, slash, pipe. What's I? What do you think I is? Uh, pipe name, can't have other thing, yeah, yep, not case sensitive, let's, uh, I guess we can print that out and see, what am I doing here, this takes in self.file name, which is a win32 string, which will convert the Rust UTF string into that, so we can print uh, file name, uh, let's see, yeah, it's taking file name, overlap reader, 
and that is on turn debug doing serial uh, it might be because of that conan that might be the issue well we would have seen two prints the first panic is the current debug one so why would it not like this 123 here's where we just google error invalid name create named pipe You need to escape it. Yup, that's yup. That's exactly what I have. Uh, access duplex. I guess maybe we'll do non-overlapped. We'll do byte. Unlimited instances. We'll do one k because that's what this dude says. I don't think that matters. And it's slash slash dot slash pipe. Isn't that what I'm doing? Slash slash dot slash pipe slash current debug, right? Slash slash, yeah. It's the same as this guy. So. Yeah. Yeah, ye I yeeted one of the first ones. Jesus, Doug. Insane yeet, dude. Come on. What has happened? Okay, slash 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 pipe slash current debug. That's standard. And it's returning. Somehow that name is invalid. How? How? <laughs> it's 2019 when I'm a boomer. <laughs> Uh, blah 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 oh do I need to be in an admin prompt or some shit is that like a really obscure error a really shitty error nope nope still broken so okay so we're calling it with the correct format. Can you just not new, do name pipes anymore? Did we just delete named pipes from Windows? Is that... Like what? Self.filename, win32 string of file name. I mean, we can print it. We can print that. Uh, print file name is <sighs> there should be a vector it should be null terminated uh, I need a question mark we'll do o2 so it should be yeah that isn't valid why is that in code wide what oh those no those are 16-bit fields okay that makes sense so well that's wrong that's wrong where's the rest of my string os string dot new okay so print os uh, string is this maybe it is a rust problem maybe i'm blaming windows for my own issues Unless, oh, it's maybe doing con in first. It might be doing con in first. Maybe that's the issue. Uh, con in. We get rid of this. Then we have to get rid of this. Okay. Okay, panicked, handle, good. All right. So yeah 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 okay. Some stuff we can blame Windows. You know, I like blaming Windows. So I forget where overlapped goes. Overlapped. That is part of duplex. Here. 
So we're now opening that. Okay. And what happens if it is a uh, current debug? What happens here? Yeah, so this is failing with five, which is, I think that's access denied. Access is denied. So maybe now we go into uh, an admin prompt. Uh, now we're getting 231 pipe busy and that is on yeah all pipe instances are busy so this is what I'm used to with hyper V so let me see if I can go back to the legacy one the previous one and now let's see if this works Maybe it's was being added. Yeah, there it is. So apparently you can open a named pipe via create file that you don't have access to as a user. And it just silently doesn't work. In interesting. Interesting. Because we have that open handle. Yeah, open handle 8C. There we go. There's the kernel message. So... For some reason, I'm able to open that pipe, right, from this prompt that isn't admin. Unless it now just is starting to work or something. I have, I have, I have no idea what I've changed. Uh, let's put the con in back in. Maybe it's con in. Maybe I'm like blocking on con in, and that's the issue. But I don't think so. Okay. So, failed to get file size. That makes sense. Um, let's see. So, now... Cool. So, I just need to have that as admin. That It apparently just silently fails if you don't have permissions. So, it is Windows' fault. I'm still blaming Windows. Okay. So, now we don't have a kernel... But let's, uh, let's talk through kind of the bootloader that we have here. So when we uh, will clear this, we got this. When we launch up Hyper-V, we get the new serial session and we'll get the print. And we get sushi roll bootloader v2 and then a panic. TFTP get size failed to get file size. And that makes sense because it's trying to load up sushi roll, um, which doesn't exist because we don't have a kernel yet. So, okay, now we're back in business, sorry. Okay, so we kind of went through the initial stage zero bootloader, and now we're going to look at what I call the actual bootloader stage one, and this is the all Rust, so that couple hundred lines of assembly runs, and then we jump into Rust, and at that point, we're now writing, hopefully, safe code. You know, we're going to have a lot of unsafe code, but whatever. Um, so the entry point to this routine, to the main function, takes three parameters, and that is a location of the soft reboot entry point, a 32-bit physical address, whether or not this is the first time the system has booted, and then a pointer to this kernel buffer, which I don't remember what that is. Uh, kernel buffer is mute kernel buffer, which is, oh, so that kernel buffer points to this region of memory in the bootloader, so this is for the soft reboot stuff. It allows a kernel to be loaded by the kernel itself. And then it tells the bootloader that instead of using Pixie to download the kernel, the kernel has already been loaded to a predefined location. So if we look at kbuff, uh, we try to get access to that field. And what we see is if, if it's not the first time we're booting and the kernel buffer size is not equal to, to bad boot, then um, we remove that range from the allocator so we don't allocate this kernel buffer from the memory manager, and then we reuse that rather than redownloading the kernel. So let's just go through this one at a time. So this is the entry point that all APs, all processors on the system will end up going through. So 
uh, when a core comes up, it'll come through this entry point, and then core IDs is a global, which starts off at zero, and we atomically increment that value. Technically, we don't need to atomically increment it, but why not? Um, so otherwise, we would need unsafe code. So here we get a unique sequential core ID for this core. So the BSP will always be core ID zero, and then after that, they're just kind of random order in boot order. Then I check, are we running on the bootstrap processor? Basically, are we the first thing booting? Are, are, should we load up a kernel? Should we do all those things? Or are we a new processor that's being spun up by the kernel? If we're a new processor, then we do other things. So in this case, this is like the first boot path. We are the BSP. And we initialize the MM subsystem, which is the memory management subsystem. We go into here. And for the MM subsystem, we call init. We get access to this global. So we have a, a static mutable, which is unsafe. But we only access it from the BSP, so it's technically safe. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to loop through the E820 twice. Um, the first time we're going to accumulate all of the free memory regions in the E820. So basically the BIOS tells us where memory is located, what memory is free, what memory is reserved for devices, what memory is used by us, like all those things. So what we do is we loop through twice. The first time we make a list of all of the things that uh, are free memory and then we go through again and remove anything that was used. So BIOSes are really bad, and it's very common that BIOSes will report something as both in use and free. So what I do is I just assume that if something is reported as in use, then it's not free. So I'm just very strict, and that's why I loop through twice. So to do E820, it's a, it's a BIOS routine, so we actually have to drop back down to 16-bit real mode to do this, and that's done through my real mode register state stuff. So I set up the processor context for a real mode BIOS call, and then I call into the BIOS here. So this, remember this is all running as 32-bit protected mode, but the BIOS has some routines that are have to be invoked from real mode. So we have this routine called invoke real mode, which um, is implemented in these uh, assembly routines that's built by NASM. And basically, all we do is we s switch from 32-bit long mode back into real mode, and then we perform, we then uh, set up this fake IRET so we can switch the mode. Then at this point, we load up the register state that the user specified. We do an IRET W, which will allow us to actually jump to the interrupt. So it, this simulates as if an interrupt occurred. Then uh, once that returns, this is once the uh, interrupt. So when you do a BIOS call, you do an interrupt. You do like an int OX2E. Well, int OX2E was Win32, but like an int OX10. Um, so once it returns back from the BIOS routine, we save all the registers, uh, copy those, and update the register state based on the new register state, and then we switch back into protected mode. And then Pixie has a similar thing where we drop down into real mode, um, and then we do the Pixie call, which is a slightly different calling convention than the real mode calls. That's why we have a separate routine. And then the same thing, we come back. Um, and then Hyper-V does some weird stuff. So we have a workaround for Hyper-V. But that's it. So this is basically some trampolines that allow us to do um, 32 and 60. Uh, we can do 16-bit calls from 32-bit space. And this is pretty common to see in bootloaders and kernels. Uh, most things will have something like this. Uh, and this is the 64-bit entry that we'll get into later. So if we go back to the invoke real mode here, this is invoking BIOS interrupt 15, which will call into the BIOS to get the memory map. Then once that returns, this register state has this like fake real mode register state and we validate did it return the value that was expected so the part of the calling convention of this api is it returns in eax this smap in ascii so we validate that that occurred then we also validate that the size of the e820 entries are what we expect so we're kind of doing sanity checks to make sure that the bios is reporting things that we expect um 
Finally, we make sure that the E820 entry has a non-zero size. And once we validated that, we, fit, we compute the end of the memory region. And then if this is the first round of the loop, um, then we're going to add the entry as a free region. So we're adding a free region into this range set. So it's just a set of ranges. But on the second loop, if we're not adding entries, then we want to remove. So if entry type is one, uh, which is the BIOS reporting free memory, we add it to the list. If it's not equal to one, which is anything but free, then we remove that. And this range set code, we're not gonna go into that, but basically it maintains a list of ranges and you could do a subtraction from that range set and it removes and splits up ranges as required to remove the range specified. Then at the end, uh, if EBX is zero, which means there's no more, um, there are no more values in the list, or if an error occurred, then we break out of the loop. Uh, finally, we update the continuation number. So basically, we invoke this each time while the BIOS is reporting uh, a new um, entry in the E820 table. And at the end of this, then we remove the first one meg of all allocatable memory. And this is because our BIOS is here and some of our structures are here. So we just indiscriminately remove the first meg of memory. So we just delete that and we'll never use that for allocation. Uh, then at this point, we set up the global state of the memory manager to initialize and enable allocations. So at this point, we now have an allocator that we'll be able to use, which is implemented here. Um, so this is doing just normal Rust stuff. Um, we implement a global allocator. When an alloc routine is called, it gets past this layout. We make sure that the uh, MM has been initialized, and then we make sure that allocations are enabled. Because once we boot the kernel, we disable all future allocations. And the reason for that is if we allowed allocations, future cores coming online could potentially allocate things and cause the kernel to have an incorrect view of what memory is present. So what we do is before we launch into the kernel, we disable allocations and never allow allocations again in the bootloader. So if it's initialized and allocations are allowed, then we call uh, allocate in the range set, which basically finds the a contiguous region of memory that satisfies the size and alignment required. Um, if we got null, then we panic with allocation failure. We couldn't fulfill allocation otherwise we return a pointer to this memory. Finally, for free, we just panic. There is nothing in the bootloader that will free. There is nothing that um, will create something and then drop it. So everything will be allocated and passed onto the kernel, and thus we hard panic if a deallocation is ever used. This also validates that we don't have a use after free because it's impossible for us to free anything, so we can't pass an invalid object to the um, kernel. So, and then the allocator is written, um, that is in range set, which we kind of talked about, which just maintains a, a set of ranges. And in this case, we make sure that the alignment is power of two, uh, zero size allocations get one byte, we compute an alignment mask, then we go through each uh, group in each range in the range set, we compute based on alignment and all of those requirements, can this allocation fit within this region? If it can't, then we go to the next region and try and try and try. Um, at the very end, uh, well here we were able to successfully allocate, so we return that out. And then finally, uh, here uh, this is, yeah, so this sets that we were able to allocate and we break out, which sets up some state. And then here, if the allocation was successful, we remove that range set from the available physical memory um, and then return out. If allocation failed, then we return a null pointer. So, and that's kind of how the allocator works. And this file just kind of handles those range sets, which are fixed size. Cool. So that gives us an allocator. And at that point, we now can do allocations uh, this is for uh, the previous kernel buffer, and now we print out to the screen using the serial port. So if we look at this, uh, this is implemented in um, shared serial. This is a very, very basic serial driver. We have a bunch of global states that track 
uh, whether serial ports are present, if they're active, and whether they've been probed and initialized. And this is for the four different standard ports on a system. And what we do is we basically try to initialize ports. Um, if the ports were working, like if they responded like a normal serial port works, then we mark that those are active. And when we go to um, write bytes, we actually invoke a closure and we send the data on every port. So every serial port these messages get sent out to, which means you don't have to worry about, oh wait, which serial port is COM2, COM1? We just broadcast all of the messages to all serial ports. So, and then elf implies CRLF, which is important. But basically when you go to write, it does write bytes and write byte write bytes does write byte for every byte and then write byte if it's a new line then it makes sure that a, a CR goes out first um, and then what it does is for each port is that incorrect no that's not um, that's fine so if it's a, a line feed then it will go and recurse into itself to print out the um, carriage return and then the new line will get printed when it resumes execution broadcast all ports we only if ports are not initialized, we try to initialize them every time a write occurs. These get initialized, and then at this point, we only send to active ports. So this is a pretty simple serial driver, um, and we run it at uh, standard like 8n1 parity and uh, no stop bits, and a we run it at 115-200 rate with no interrupts, and all like all the interrupts are disabled, we're doing polling. So that's that serial driver. And then at this point, we get CPU features, which is to get the list of all the features that the CPU supports in kind of a nice uh, Rust enum. So this does all the CPU IDs and kind of extracts that information such that at Rust level, we're able to assert, okay, we only work on 64 bits. You have to support execute disabled. You have to support gigabyte pages. You have to support all of the standard SSEs. Um, then at that point, if it's the first boot or the kernel buffer size is bad boot, we download the kernel, the next stage. We set up the pointers and buffers to refer to this kernel. And then we return that as the kernel PE. Otherwise, if, a, if the kernel that previously was running in a soft reboot scenario has already populated this with a new kernel, then we just return that. So basically download it if, if we have to download it, otherwise use what's already there. Uh, then we parse the PE, which we'll get into. Um, this is allocating message windows, and this is for all the message passing stuff. So we will, um, uh, since this is where we're gonna start to change things, because we're gonna use, we're not gonna use a message passing kernel, it's just overly complex and just would make our life a lot more difficult than it needs to be. So let's take a look at kind of how the Pixie downloading works, because that's the one thing we kind of glossed over. So I have a Pixie driver in the bootloader, all written in Rust. Um, and what this allows me to do is I can download a file over Pixie using the Pixie APIs provided to me by the BIOS to download a file based on a name. So first of all, you can only ever do this if you're the BSP. So I panic if you're not the BSP. This is just to prevent me from making a mistake. Um, then what I do is this is how you query. Uh, the pixie spec kind of defines this. If you do a BIOS in 1A routine with AX filled with this magic number, then it will return back the address of the um, pixie magic block. And the pixie block is how you figure out how to access... Um, kind of uh, your MAC address, your IP, and these things, and where you can find the functions that you have to invoke to do Pixie transactions. So in this case, we check the carry flag to see if the install check succeeded. We check for the Pixie magic, and at this point, we know that an EBX and ES EBX points to the Pixie environment structure. So we cast that here, and now at this point, we have access to the Pixie API. Then what we do is we validate that this structure seems sane. So we make sure the size matches exactly what you expect for the Pixie uh, block. 
we do a checksum on that structure to make sure it's valid. We check the signature that it matches the pixie and plus, and we check that the version is the correct version, which is 2.1, which is from like 1997. So at that point, we validated, okay, it looks like we definitely were given correct access to Pixie. So then we do TFTP read file. And this is where all the magic happens. So in here, we make sure the file name is short enough to work in a TFTP request. It's required to be under 128 characters plus a null terminator. Um, we then have to get our DHCP server IP from Pixie cached info. So the DHCP server IP is also where the TFTP server is running. Uh, checksum equals zero. That is correct. So what they do is they have a checksum field inside of the structure that is the checksum, which then means when you checksum the whole structure, including that checksum field, that checksum cancels out the rest of the structure, so it should be zero. So zero means that it's correct. It means that, like, after everything, the checksum was valid. So, and that is the correct way to check it for there. So that's a, a relatively common thing to see. So now we're in TFTP read file. We get the server IP because we need to figure out which IP we're requesting the next stage of the kernel from. So in this case, we're making a request. We're saying, I want to do a pixie opcode, get cached info, and I pass in this cached info structure, which says, I want to get the DHCP ACK packet. Um, and then I don't give it a buffer size. It fills that in. So I do this pixie call, which goes here, which I use to map uh, Rust enums of different pixie opcodes into their actual opcodes that are used in the pixie API. It's just to make the code a little cleaner. So this allows me to do a pixie opcode, get cached info. I make sure that it succeeded. And then at that point, I know at offset OX15 from the IP address, because this is a this is a full IP packet, I'm going to get that value, and that is the IP of the DHCP server from the DHCP ACK packet that Pixie cached for me. So at that point, I now have the server IP. I now have to figure out the file size so I can figure out how much room I need to allocate. So I request the file size. I copy uh, the file name into this request because the file name is right here. I then request the file size, make sure that it was successful, and then I assert that the file was a non-zero size. This is just like a sanity check. You're never loading a zero size kernel, so this is just an extra check I could add. Um, at this point, I see if I have enough, uh, if the file size is smaller than the static kernel buffer size. So I just allow a one meg kernel in terms of the PE file, I think. Yeah, this is based on the PE file. So you could have a kernel that has 100 megs of BSS, and that doesn't matter at this point. This is just to validate that the kernel itself fits within the size. Um, so we technically could allocate specifically the size of the kernel we're downloading, but in the soft reboot scenario, it's possible that the kernel grows in size when you reboot it. So we need to have kind of a larger size that we want to allow, and it's just this. And we could easily tweak this to be whatever size you want. So then we allocate that buffer using that specific size. Uh, we create a local stack buffer, which, um, so this address might not be in, uh, this is, so anything we allocate actually won't be in that first meg because we block anything from the first meg from being allocated. Thus, since we're using real mode APIs, we have to do, we have to use a buffer that is in real mode. So what we do is we use a stack local since we set our stack to OX7C00, which means that this stack local will be in real mode addressable address space. So, and we describe that because I would not have remembered that if I didn't make this comment. So I try to make comments like that to remember um, then we create a, a TFTP open request at that server IP using the standard TFTP port. That's the default port. Um, we report the packet size, we copy in the file name, and we send the open request. And then we validate that everything is sane. So we validate it succeeded. We validate that the negotiated packet size is greater than or equal to 512, which is a requirement 
for the TFTP protocol. So this is making sure they comply. And then I also make sure that the negotiated size is less than or equal to that of the length that we allocated and requested. So we make sure it doesn't say like, hey, I would like to use a 512 byte buffer. And it's like, okay, let's use 1K packets. So I make sure that that is in bounds as well. So I just am pretending like the TFTP server has bugs or issues and I'm making sure that it's behaving as I expect. At that point, we have now opened the file and we're just going to send the read request in a loop while we have more parts to read. So we make sure that um, it was successful. We make sure that the amount of bytes that were read is less than or equal to that of the negotiated packet size. So just in case it sends us a larger packet than we have anticipated. Um, I then compute the, uh, I compute that whether this will exceed the expected file size. So basically if we're reading more data than the file size that we requested earlier was, then we panic out. There is a race condition there, but just don't replace your kernel while you're booting it. Um, and then once that passes, we know that everything is in bounds and valid. So we just copy that into the buffer. Uh, we have a little progress bar here that um, you haven't seen because we don't have a kernel it's booting yet. Uh, then uh, the read is the, so based on the uh, Pixie API, the read is complete once the first packet came in that is less than uh, the negotiated packet size. So I say, if the buffer size is different, then we break out of the loop. And at that point, we've now downloaded the entire file. So we assert that we read exactly the amount of bytes that we were anticipating we would have to read for the kernel. Finally, we close the file. That's it. And we're done. And we return out. So we have a lot of stuff here, which is all Pixie things. So this is just structured documentation of the Pixie structures that are used like the pixie environment structure here um we have like checksum routines and stuff that you saw that are in here but none of those really matter in terms of code flow so that's the pixie driver and the api for it is great you just say download file you give it a name and you get a vector containing that entire file like that's the exactly the level of like api i, I enjoy it's just i don't have to worry about anything here uh, finally, we parse the PE file. So this is gonna go into my PE loader. What we just downloaded was a complete PE file. So here, we're just gonna skip it, but this is a complete PE file loader that can handle relocations for 64-bit files uh, because all of our kernels get ASLR'd because there's no reason to not ASLR your kernel. Um, then we allocate room for the message windows, and this is for the old sushi roll kernel so for sushi roll i had to go through each cpu and make these windows which is how they were able to communicate this is setting up the the channels that they use to communicate which were based on shared pages so when i said before that sushi roll didn't have any mutable shared memory that's not a hundred percent true there was one exception and that is the pages that allow the fundamental communication and uh, message passing to work. But other than that, everything is built on these pages. Uh, are TLS callbacks supported in the PE loader? No. <laughs> so in my, in Sushi Roll, since there was no shared mutable memory, technically a global was thread local because each core had its own, each hardware thread had its own copy of the kernel, um, which is kind of an interesting model. So a standard global was actually thread local. It was a really weird kernel design. I actually liked a lot of things about it, um, but it's just not very intuitive. And I, I'm not going to work on a research project in that environment, although I've done a lot of research projects in that environment. So this was going through for each CPU. So remember that allocations are disabled once cores come up. So, or once we have gone to the kernel. So basically we have to pre-allocate all of the stacks for threads that will come online. So um, here we create a new page table. 
So each core before had its own page table and its own kernel location. So every single uh, hardware thread would get its own loaded copy of the kernel at its own different ASLR location and its own complete address space. Um, I would pick a kernel address. So here I pick, this is where the ASLR occurs. I pick a random kernel base. Um, I have this commented out because I use this for like testing. I then load the kernel at that location for that in that page table. I create a one meg stack. I add the message window, which is used for that IPC. I then construct this core info, which is passed to the, um, this is the information that the bootloader passes to the kernel so that the kernel knows some of the things that we looked up. For example, this, the physical memory regions, like what is available, these kernel buffers and the soft reboot entries, we pass on to the kernel such that they can use these and like know what memory is valid. Um, BSP message windows, this is setting up the message window receivers for the other side. Um, and here you see where we pick a random address, we punch in a, a non-executable writable present page, that's 4K, and this is the message window used to communicate between the BSP and cores. Uh, and then finally, for the BSP, they get a copy. The BSP gets a copy of the physical memory map. Um, so at this point, I do clone mm table. And if we look at clone mm table, what this does is it returns a copy of the range set um, that contains the valid memory, like the remaining memory that we have not allocated in the bootloader that's available for the kernel to use. At this point, once this routine has been called, we disable allocations to prevent future cores from changing the state. And then we return a copy of the memory management table. So once this routine is called, we have locked in the state of memory. All the utilization of memory is, is fixed. And then we pass the state of the table onto the kernel. So now the kernel will be able to track um, what memory it can use, what memory is still free after the bootloader and the BIOS. So that information is only passed to the BSP because the BSP is who initializes the kernel and sets that up in a global and kernel space. Finally, we have all these structures that we forget about because we don't want Rust to free these structures uh, because these are going to be used in the kernel and indefinitely from this point on in the system. Um, finally, that was, the, that was in the if BSP, so basically on first boot or for the, the manager of the system. At this point, everyone does the same thing. They get access to their core info for their core ID. They then um, jump into the 64-bit kernel, and that's it. And enter 64 is implemented here, where we... Um, we set up CR3, we set up uh, non -X, uh, NX enable, we set up long mode enable, we set up these, which is required to get SSE working. So this is uh, OS uh, uh, float X save. I think this is to enable, um, is that for X save? I'm not sure. Um, then OS uh, XMM exceptions. So you get exceptions from the SSE engine. Uh, physical address extensions, which is uh, required for paging. DE, which is debugger, I think debug extensions. I think this gives you access to the uh, DR registers, maybe? D uh, unless this is a divide error. I, no, no, I don't know. Uh, then we set up CR0. We clear the emulation flag. We set protected mode enabled. Uh, we mon set monitor coprocessor, which is required for x87 and XMM. Set up write protect, so we make it so that um, the write bit is respected in page tables. And then we set page ena enable, we enable paging, we load a 64-bit GDT, and then we jump into long mode. So at this point, we are now executing uh, in 64-bit code. We reset the data seg... Uh, selectors for 64-bit data segments here. This is to enable OSX save, which is uh, X save, so we can get access to AVX2 and AVX512, which um, I technically no longer need because I can dynamically set that. Uh, and then I set up the calling conventions for the kernel. 
Um, Microsoft calling conventions has homing space, so we make sure there's extra room on the stack. We set up the parameters. This is to set up an IRET queue, which allows us to long jump into long mode. And then IRET queue, this branches us into the kernel. At this point, the kernel has somehow returned, which should not be possible, so we halt forever. Um, but yeah, after this point, we have launched the kernel, and we are we're done in um, we're done in the bootloader. So that is basically this bootloader. It's a decent quality bootloader. I've put a decent amount of effort into it, so I have really no reason to rewrite this bootloader. Um, it's pretty cool that it's entirely in Rust. I don't know of anyone who has a bootloader written in Rust. Um, and it fits in the 32K size requirement by quite a margin. I It's a 20K bootloader, and I have 32K as a requirement. So it's, it's a, a 12K under that size. Humble brag. Humble brag implies it was, I was trying to be a, a sneaky with the brag. No, I'm just straight up bragging there. <laughs> So this is the bootloader, and at this point, um, we can now basically write a kernel. So anything that we write that expects the parameters that are passed in here, um, if we just build a 64-bit PE file, this will boot it and jump into the entry routine. So we could start a new kernel. I'm actually going to take the sushi roll... Uh, um, just, I'm going to take the cargo and the tomals. Actually, I'll take, I'll take everything for now, like the git ignores, and we'll just delete pretty much everything from it. So we'll go into earn slice. Uh, whoops. I just completely botched that by pacing in the wrong spot. God damn it. Um, luckily we can just grab those files from... Sushi roll again. Oh, so what did I need? I need lock, toml, git ignore, source. I think those are all the things. Okay. And then we grab kernel. We'll just copy and paste that here. Then for source, we're going to delete everything but main. And then I'm just going to hide for a second. I'm going to make one last check of this file to make sure we can look at this. But we should be able to. Um, okay, that looks fine. That looks okay. So... Cool, I think this looks fine, that's good. We won't have that, we won't have that. Uh, those we don't have. Ooh, let me change, I gotta change one thing in cargo toml, cargo lock. We'll delete that. And then cargo toml. Uh, okay. And safe cast, and then we go into shared safe cast. That I don't think we need. Okay, I think we're good. We didn't have anything there, but uh, okay. So let's uh, bite safe to arrive. Oh shit! I deleted that. My bad. I didn't think I was using that. Uh, safe cast. Okay, so, yep, that makes sense. Let me delete that. Oh, one second. Let's see. Page code, where is that? That is in, ah, uh, should be in the build stuff. Page code. Page code. NASM. Okay, I think, yeah. That didn't really matter. Okay, so now this is building a kernel, and this is failing because we don't have panic, and we need to, we'll grab that out of sushi roll, and we'll double check that the sushi roll one is good. Kernel, source, panic. I think we have core requirements as well that we need. 
So we'll whack those in there. So in kernel, we have core requirements, main, and panic. Uh, there's mm, which I don't think we need yet, but we will bring that in very quickly. So this is what I previously had. That's BSP message, interrupts, all that shit goes away. Error stack, uh, global allocator we don't have temporarily. Rust um. Uh, temporarily, we don't have that. Um, we don't have thread locals yet. So that's fine. Okay. And now we have BSP. So blah, blah, blah. Here we'll just do CPU halt. Uh, and we don't really need these CPU checks. So, okay, so now we have some thread locals, which is here. So, this will eventually need a lock. So, we'll do this. And what else do we have here? Unused.comment, thread local on 27. Uh, same thing here. We don't have thread locals yet. We'll be adding those soon. Uh, probe soft reboot. Where is that? That might be in panic. Okay, here. Uh, if so, this will just be. Uh, we're just gonna ignore that for now. Just on panics, we're gonna halt. And finally, no global memory allocated, but one is required. Um, so let's just grab what we have for MM from the bootloader and grab that global allocator temporarily. And then we're just going to core this out and make it uh, panic out. So we're just going to whack this in the kernel temporarily just to give us something here. And this we can enable. And here we just do panic alloc not supported. And we'll get rid of these. And something like that. Layout. Yep, we need standard alloc layout, which is our core. I think we want this one. We'll put this here. Use this. Oops. Uh, global alloc, this one as well. And mm, not found. That makes sense because it's just local. We're just going to do that one line for now. Uh, so I'm just stubbing out some of these basic things that are required to get this kernel to work. Uh, unused macro use on alloc. Then new. Nothing for that. This is not, we can just do this, I think. And cool. Now that's not linking because we have to make that modification we made here. We just get rid of the dash seven. And finally, we have a kernel. And that might, I wonder if that got deployed. Uh, we have orange slice dot boot so we built the kernel we just have to do the copy now which is in our main.rs uh, blah 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 set current directory to kernel let's make sure these paths are sane so we should have orange slice kernel target this release should be a kernel at exe, which there is. 3K, big kernel, <laughs> big kernels. Um, and building kernel, finish release. Then blah, 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 CD back for this. If doesn't exist, deploying kernel to that. So for some reason, oh yeah, we, yeah, we changed this stuff again. Whoops. Uh, 
And this is uh, orange slice. Good. So now we'll get rid of the sushi roll, the orange slice. We'll do a um, carry on clean, which should clean out all the builds. And now in TFTPD, we'll get rid of the both of those. And this will now build everything from scratch. So we're building the bootloader now. Bootloader's done. Now we're booting the kernel. The kernel's done. And they both were copied to TFTP. TFTP. And then let me see. Sushi roll. Uh, this will be... This is, I guess, the last reference to sushi roll. That's now orange slice. So it's possible it doesn't work because we don't have the windowing stuff set up, but who knows? So... Here we go, and that booted up, and it halted, which I think is what we told it to do. So, cool. Now, in the kernel, we're able to use format strings. So we have format strings explicitly disabled in the bootloader because they bring in the formatting libraries which make the bootloader too large. But we should now be able to do hello world parameter is x param. And uh, if we did everything right, then we should be able to just boot this. And there we go. So we are we now have a kernel. So now we can write stuff and we can just do print. We can do print with full format strings right away, right when the kernel launches. Um, and everything's fine and dandy. So at this point, we now do real kernel development. So... Um, I can probably prune some of these things down. So let's uh, clean up all of these issues in core requirements on page 96. Uh, or not on page 96, on uh, line 96. This is, was that what it was complaining about? Uh, in kernel, make a fake. Uh, isn't that where we are? Mm, 96. 96. Oh, here we go. So this is unused because you can't have document comments on global assembly. Then here we have layout is unused at 53. Uh, 53. So we'll just say layout. We'll just comment that. And then try from is no longer a... A uh, feature that is okay. So now we hopefully I can like get rid of some of these things. I don't know if any of these are required. Uh, run clean. I'm just trying to remove some of these features that are probably no longer required. Uh, let's also get rid of these warnings too. So this is in. Byte safe derive uh, main.rs in, okay, that is the bootloader. In the bootloader, main.rs. We want to get rid of atomic use size init because I guess we're not using it anymore. Oh, yeah, I guess that's getting deprecated. That makes sense. So if we go to 128, we now atomic use size new zero. That's the new syntax. And hopefully we have no warnings or errors now, building both the bootloader and kernel. Looks good. And looks great. So there we go. We now have a very, very basic start of a kernel with some things that I can remove because we still don't need. So some of the stuff that we'll have to get rid of will be the... Um, we will get rid of the windows, these uh, f the physical windows, the message windows, the uh, the message windows for the BSP. So we'll be able to reduce some of this code. Um, and then what else? And then in here, I think all of this stays. I have a couple things that can go. So what dependencies do I have for shared libraries? I have. 
shared we have cpu which i need uh folk assembly that is my assembler which we do not need lock cell which i don't think we're using um yeah so we're not using lock cell so we don't need that uh mmu we are using ring set we're using safecast we're using and serial loop we're using so this should no longer build uh, run clean. So to do so that's not gonna work because that depended on folk assembly, which it doesn't anymore. Because uh, we ripped out all the code, we just have to remove this. And now I think we no longer have any still code in this code base. Uh, extern create, which is in here, no longer pull that in. And there we go. We now have a kernel and a bootloader that work together. And yeah, the bootloader is 21K and it's 11K for the kernel. So we don't even care about size. Um, but I think this is, uh, I, might, uh, I might wrap up here just because I think this is a good introduction and the next stream, we'll write an allocator. We'll write a physical memory manager. Uh, a physical memory manager, an allocator. We'll bring in um, stuff to walk the ACPI tables. ACPI? Why does that not sound right? But I think it is right. Yeah, ACPI tables to figure out the cores. We'll bring up the other cores. And so the next stream will probably be like, three hours similar to kind of this way was this three hours yeah so it'll be about roughly this size we'll write a um we'll write the physical memory manager and allocator we'll bring up the other cores on the system and at that point once we have all those things ready i think we're ready to start working on a hypervisor so uh at this point any questions people have before i wrap this up uh now that you're a bit into the kernel portion can you elaborate a bit more on how you achieve such fast snapshot resets for fuzzing uh are you doing that with hyper-v or with a purpose-built hypervisor so with, only with the purpose-built hypervisor have i been able to get it to go fast enough so on windows there's a an api called get right watch that you can use in user space which allows you to monitor which regions of memory have been dirtied since the last time you queried them for modification. With the Windows Hypervisor Platform API that I used for Apple Pie, I was also able to get something similar for the hypervisor there. But those, I could only query those APIs like maybe 30 to 50 times a second. Um, however, in my hypervisor, my Fulkervisor, like bare metal hypervisor, uh, we walk the page tables. I actually might have that code. Let me quickly see here what I have, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I have a routine for the page tables, which is for each page. And this goes through and it walks the page table. So it walks each 512 entries at the top level of the page table. If any of them are present, then it recurses into the next one. If that's present, it recurses and goes on and so, so on and so forth. Um, and this is the whole routine that I use to walk the page tables to find what memory has been modified during a fuzz case. So I only reset the memory that has changed. So if you have a four gig hypervisor or a VM and you're fuzzing Word, or let's say like libjpg, and libjpg during the fuzz case touches one meg of unique memory, this will immediately tell me to only reset that one meg of memory. I won't reset all four gigs. I will only reset the, at the page level granularity, I'll only reset the memory which has been modified by the fuzz case. So I'm not resetting everything, um, but I'm getting the same effect by resetting the memory that has been touched. So, and I need to do kind of similar things for the devices such that I can reset the devices that I emulate as well. So yeah, that code is already in here and we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a bit, but I think that's just going to wrap it up for today. I don't want to go too crazy and get burnt out. 
I think this is a good size stream that people can now watch um, and kind of get up to speed with, with these things. So any other questions before I wrap it up? Um, and this stuff I'll push into GitHub. I'm just gonna do one final look through of the code, like all the code to make sure I'm not pushing anything I shouldn't be pushing. Um, but this will probably be up on GitHub within an hour. And I'll probably tweet that I like updated the GitHub with the, with the bootloader and kernel and stuff. So cool. Any other questions? Otherwise I'm gonna wrap up here. So thanks everyone for tuning in. I hope, uh, I hope this was kind of fun. And I think we're right on track for exactly where I wanted to be. Uh, do you play on Turtle Wow? I, me uh, I mentioned it before. Not sure if you saw it. Uh, I wrote their anti cheat. Would be happy to show you the word code. Interesting. Um, I actually have not played it. I logged in and I saw that there were like 40 people online, which was going to be tough. So. I don't really care how many people are online for RP, but I do care about if they are of my level range. And there was just no one between like level one and 20 online when I played. So it's like, it's gonna be hard to get into an RP scenario that I don't, I don't know. The, the first 20 levels of leveling would really suck because it'd be half experience rates and I would like not really be running into anyone. I know I could join a guild and maybe find people who would like make alts with me or something. But um, I like Turtle Wow. It looks really cool. And I think if it had a little bit more population, I would play it. And it hurts me to say that because if I'm part of the reason it doesn't have a big population because I'm not willing to join until it is a population. Like, I could be the one that caused other people to play because I increased the population by playing. Um... If you're looking for RP, yeah, there aren't many RP private servers on any expansion. Yeah, uh, I play a lot of RP in retail WoW. Um, right now I'm playing a Burning Crusade private server. I forget what it's called. Uh, it's like the big one, like Neverwing or something like that. I'm like level 18 or 19 and I am loving it. Um, so I've played on vanilla private servers as well. Uh, basically all of them that have been out. So, oh, cool. Awesome, yeah. Netherwing is the one that, I, uh, that I'm actively playing on right now. Like, basically, I'm going to end this stream, audit this code, figure out, make sure everything in this code base I can make public, push it, and then I'll probably go level up a bit in, uh, in Burning Crusade. So, uh, I don't know. I've been having a blast playing that. So, one thing that I like about that server is... Um, it doesn't have the dynamic spawn rates, or maybe it has like some dynamic spawn rates, but the spawn rates aren't as nutty as they are for the big vanilla server, the one with like 10,000 concurrent players. Um, so you can actually like kill things strategically and then kill things because things are not respawned. The vanilla private server I played on, things respawn so fast that you can't strategically clear out mobs to make room to fight more mobs, which just doesn't give me an authentic WoW experience. So, yeah, I, I would love to look into that. I'm actually looking into writing some anti-cheat for some MapleStory private servers, uh, mainly because I've completely cheated my ass off in MapleStory and just completely like solved cheating in those games. The whole thing is automated. Character creation, logging in, going to a new map, killing things on that map until level 10, going off the main island, getting a job, moving to a better map, farming there, and then every once in a while, they all the bots instantaneously like traverse the map to a location where they drop all of their inventory and my other player picks it up so I can sell it. <laughs> So like the whole thing, and it's like at this point I'm bored of cheating, so I'd rather help them out because I'm, I genuinely enjoyed the server I was on, even though I was cheating my ass off. <laughs> so we'll see. But cool, yeah. So I don't know when the next stream will be. Um, I do run a team now, technically, so I want to be there for team members and whatever, so that is always first priority in my life, but... Um, I, I hope we'll get to the next section soon because the next stream, which will be like two or three hours, will probably put us at the point where the stream after that will actually be writing a hypervisor. 
So we'll be getting pretty close. So cool. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and feel free to contact me on Twitter or anything or ask questions or leave comments here. So thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you guys uh, probably within a, a two weeks, but probably within a week. So thanks for tuning in. Bye.